Well, welcome, guys, to season 10 of Grow More in uh, of the BizHack Live Masterclass series. The theme for this season is Grow More in 24. Every year around this time in the fourth quarter, we do a series of masterclasses talking about business strategy. We had four last year, and we have four amazing sessions coming up this year. Very excited to have the amazing uh, Brad Stevens from Outsource Access here to talk to us about lessons from one of the great business gurus of all time, Jim Collins, and how we can apply those enduring lessons from Jim Collins to your small business and how Brad has applied those to his. Um, we're going to launch a quick survey uh, because we have a couple really exciting training opportunities in addition to these master classes that we wanted you guys to be aware of. Um, and there are two basic sets of opportunities. The first is if you happen to be based in Miami Dade County, um, we run a training course in social media advertising, specifically how to run ads on Facebook and Instagram. And we have revamped the course to incorporate all of the new AI tools that Meta and other big companies have built. Um, this is our signature course. Uh, I've been running it now for seven years. More than a thousand businesses have run through it. We're going to be running it just once in 2024. It kicks off on January 22nd. And uh, Miami-Dade County has generously provided 35 scholarships uh, to fund most of the fees associated with the course. There's just a $497 commitment fee. So if this sounds exciting to you, um, in the poll, uh, did we launch the poll, by the way? Okay. I see it in launch right now. I see it now. Um, in the poll, you'll see um, asks if you're a business uh, if, if you or your business are based in Miami-Dade County, you qualify. Um, and then <clears throat> the scholarship uh, for $3,000, um, we have a limited number. We have a lot of folks who've already opted in. There is a, a vetting process, so we can't guarantee you'll get the scholarship. But if you indicate your interest, uh, we would love to have you. And then second is, you know, BizHack really specializes in training uh, business support organizations, and we do a lot of free training for organizations like that. So if you're part of uh, a group like EO, Entrepreneurs Organization, which Brad and I are part of, if you're part of a chamber of commerce, if you're in a, uh, if you uh, are in a training program or an industry group, anybody who would benefit from kind of cutting edge marketing training and you're willing to make an introduction to somebody uh, on the team that organizes that, please let me know that uh, in, in the survey as well. Uh, we've been doing a lot of those types of trainings. We had more than 60 sessions, training sessions that we did uh, over the course of last year, and we'd love to have you um, connect us and to do more of that kind of work. I wanted to acknowledge our funder, which is Miami Dade County and the office of the mayor, Daniela Levine Cava. Um, she has several initiatives that uh, are part of this masterclass series and make it possible. The first is Future Ready. Future Ready is really about building a 21st century workforce in Miami-Dade County. And a lot of the purpose behind these masterclasses is to give you those 21st century skills that you need, whether it's around business strategy or AI tools. The Strive 305 initiative is specifically about supporting small businesses. And then the Miami Dade Public Library System is our newest partner. They're uh, in featuring a lot of BizHacks training on their amazing portal website. And they're also um, distributing information about these masterclasses to their 50 branch locations. We're very grateful to have them as a new partner for Miami Dade County to help spread the word about these masterclasses, this free service. Our media sponsor is South Florida PBS. And we have uh, more than two dozen community partners who have helped spread the word to their members and who serve small businesses. This is kind of a, a who's who of small business support uh, in our community. I wanted to welcome you. Uh, my name is Dan Gretsch. If we haven't met, I'm the founder and CEO of BizHack, and I'm the host of these master classes. Um, and uh, I think what you should know about me is I'm a small business owner to uh, struggling, probably like you are, to uh, balance uh, work and, and life and, and to make uh, ends meet and, and to provide for my family, but also be present for my family. It's a it's a massive struggle. 
Uh, one thing I will say is that spending time now thinking about your goals for 2024 and your strategy to achieve those goals is probably the most important work you can do as a business owner. So I'm very glad that you're here. You're part of the uh, group of folks who actually value um, strategic training, and, and it's great to have you here. Also, a little bit more about the Masterclass series. This was a series that BizHack uh, began uh, on our own during COVID in March uh, of 2020 because we were just hearing from our small business community that they needed help. How do you uh, how do you communicate during a crisis? What do you do when you have to your storefront and you have to shut your doors? And um, BizHack itself was really disrupted by COVID. We were at that point a purely in person training academy. We had to cancel all of our classes. Um, we quickly pivoted, moved them onto Zoom, and then relaunched uh, as an online training academy. And um, you know, basically, we've gone from there. Uh, but it was a near death experience for sure, and a lot of sleepless nights, as so many of us experienced during COVID. And what we were hearing at the time was that you guys wanted uh, help uh, with best practices to how to market during a, an emergency, during a crisis. And that's where the Masterclass series began. We did more than 50 sessions for free with no funding. And then we got noticed uh, by uh, a couple uh, national award uh, organizations. These are four of the national awards that we've won. And also by Miami-Dade County, which has been generously funding for the last three years, these masterclasses. So um, this is probably some of the most important work I've done in my professional life. And I'm, I'm really proud of it. And I'm also really grateful to people like Brad Stevens, uh, who have joined us to be part of this movement in support of small businesses. Brad is himself the owner uh, of Outsource Access, which is a small business. He's part of EO, Entrepreneurs Organization. This is a networking group uh, and a support group for entrepreneurs everywhere. Um, Brad's a really impressive dude. Um, he's grown his company to more than 500 employees over four years. Uh, and he just was ranked 326 on the Inc. 5000 and in the top 7% fastest growing in the country. Uh, he uh, is an amazing presenter. You're going to love hearing from him. And if you like him, and you will, you're going to want to stay in touch with him. And one of the best ways to do that is through his podcast, Automate and Delegate. Uh, we'll put the automatedelegate.com uh, into the chat if, if uh, John or Jose, you could do that. Um, and... I absolutely recommend his podcast. And then um, as a kind of gift and a thank you for, for being here today, um, if you send an email to tools at outsourceaccess.com and you put bizhack in the subject line, he's going to send you all of the curriculum that he's built around what he's going to present to you today. Because he doesn't just talk about this. He lives it, as you see, in his business. And it's what's allowed him, frankly, to grow so quickly and to be one of the fastest growing companies in the country. So he's living these uh, principles. And that's what makes today so special is you're going to hear from a small business owner about how he's taken the principles of Jim Collins and turned them into uh, one of the fastest growing businesses in the country. So with that, um, welcome to the session. Uh, on Jim Collins Lessons for Small Businesses. Uh, Brad Stevens is our uh, amazing uh, ho uh, instructor and he's gonna share with us the lessons that Jim Collins can teach all of us. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Brad. Would you like to share your screen uh, so you can advance through the slides or would you prefer that I do it? No, sure, happy to, uh, to drive here, no problem. And for, for those of you who are just joining, uh, we just put out a, um, a poll uh, inviting you to let us know about uh, the scholarships that we're offering for uh, one of our courses, as well as um, if you are part of a business support organization. Here we go, Dan. So I've got my three monitors here, and sometimes I get confused on which ones it wants to show up on there all right we good perfect looks great fantastic 
Well, excited to be with everybody here today. And uh, Dan, thanks so much for what you've done to put this whole initiative together. Um, you know, living and breathing entrepreneurship my entire life since uh, 20 years old. Actually, third grade was my first uh, lemonade uh, stand experience. I uh, certainly know it and, and live it and breathe it. And have been at all the stages. I'm sure everyone on this call is on. So uh, I'm right there, right there with you and appreciate you putting the time and effort on these educational series, because it's series just like this that, that I've attended throughout the years that have helped me kind of get through um, and get on the other side, being among you know common ground of individuals struggling with the same you know kind of challenges. So uh, I love educating on this. I love giving back. And, um, you know, as you saw that list of tools that we share, um, you know, that's kind of a part of the the equation. So excited to, to jump into this with you and, um, and add a lot of value for, for everybody on the call today. And I lost it as far as the last one to start off on this screen right here, Dan. Perfect. You're doing great. Perfect. Um, and look, everybody, we're going to go pretty, pretty fast paced, pretty high energy. Okay. And I, and I know on, on zoom calls, I got to deliver five X energy for it to hit a one X on your side. So uh, I'm excited to uh, share a lot with you here. This is recorded. So there'll chance to be able to go back and uh, take some additional notes and you want to do another review or you and your teams um, want to keep this high energy and engaging. And, you know, I could go about a, a million miles deep and 19 rabbit holes and all these different topics, but I tried to keep it pretty tight. Uh, just some, a few specific examples in each of these categories that we're going to go over here uh, today. Um, and just confirming, Dan, as far as our time, we're hard stop at 1.30, correct? So we're right at 45-minute mark? No, we have two hours. We have an hour and a half, so it's a 90 minutes. But okay, we don't have to stop sorry. Two. Perfect, okay. Um, all right, so Jim Collins, uh, for everybody, you know, that's that, that's on the call, right? And if you hear the name Jim Collins, you may have done sort of what I did a little bit when I revisited Jim Collins. Um, when I read a lot of everybody's heard, right? when you bring up Jim Collins, right? Any Anybody in business has heard of, oh, yeah, Jim Collins. Yeah, good to great, great books, great content and so forth. Um, but a lot of them haven't really fully absorbed and, and, and leveraged it in a, in a lot of ways, right? They're familiar with it and they know good to great. Um, and I was similar in my case, right? Uh, and in, in this business, which we'll talk about, Outsource Access, we launched four years ago. Um, we had a, an advisor that helped us from the beginning in, in, uh, in kicking off our business. And one of the first things she did is she said, I want your entire management team to reread Good to Great, Jim Collins. And all of us were a little bit of a sigh. It's like, uh, okay, isn't that the book that talked about like Circuit City and some of these businesses maybe that aren't around today? Um, but I tell you, it was back during COVID and uh, my wife's family lives up to Michigan. And so I had to listen to it on audio. And, you know, we had a 13 hour drive between Atlanta <laughs> to into Michigan. And I remember re-listening to Good to Great um, or re-engaging the content. And, and I tell you, I don't know if a lot of you can relate, but sometimes you listen to content at a different stage in your life and it just hits you in a whole different way. Uh, and I was actually president of the EO Atlanta chapter at that point with about 160 members. And you can imagine all the chaos I was dealing with there trying to, you know, keep our members engaged and retain and, and add value in a time we couldn't get together. And I was uh, in the middle of growing this, you know, rocket ship business that was growing, you know, by incredible growth. Um, and so rereading Good to Great at that point, it's just like, wow, how did I not get this when I was back in my 20s? And again, I was at a different state, much smaller business, not in the same place. But it's like, these are truly the timeless principles about how to run and operate uh, you know, a, a business. Um, and then I just kind of went deep and I went back into all of his books and reread and re-engaged. And the thing I love about Jim Collins, and these are the seven books that, that he's written over the years, is, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are all, they're all about opinion, that are all about, you know, whatever their latest thoughts and, 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 and perspectives are. Collins goes into a hole in a decade with about 15 research assistants or more, right? Sorry, not sure the exact number. And they do deep data analysis and look at historically what have been the most successful companies and why, and put a tremendous amount of thought and effort into um, into their book, into his books. Uh, and so all his books that have been written here, you know, Good to Great, Built to Last, Turning the Flywheel, Great by Choice, uh, Good to Great by the Social Sectors, which is one specifically for the nonprofit, How the Mighty Fall, um, and one most recent Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0 have all got a tremendous amount of deep uh, research and analysis put in there. Um, and a good to great specifically studied over 1400 companies and looked at them over, you know, a long span of time, uh, you know, 40 plus years, I think for most of them. And so you know, regardless of industry, regardless of, of luck, good or bad luck, which we'll talk about, they thrived and they went from good to great and then had major inflection points and were successful and had the same things to navigate the rest of the world did the rest of other companies did in terms of economy and what have you but but thrive um and so all of his books had that same type of analysis and looking at companies looking at leaders and really distilling down what about them made them successful and 
Look, you'll learn number one as an entrepreneur, if you're going to be successful, you got to get ego out of the way and just constantly ask, I don't know what I don't know and constantly look. I'm not about reinventing the wheel. Where can I go find where the resources exist that's proven? And so the little known thing that people don't realize about Jim Collins is on his website, okay? And everybody knows his books. And I want to pull this up live here. I'm going to show with everybody. Um, and Dan, you guys can see this. I pulled it over here. The website. Yep. Yeah, it's looking great. Okay. So for those of you looking here, so obviously his books, Audible and so forth, you can dive into, and I'll share with you kind of a shortened curriculum that we that we put together. Uh, you can get by email into that tools at Outsource Access. But if you go to Jim Collins' website, when I was rereading his content, is I went on and just was kind of digging in further and realized if you go to his website and you click on this thing called Concepts, right? And on his website, he's got all of his books and he's got some different great tools related to his books that I didn't even realize as well. But if you click on Concepts, he has this thing called the map, right? And he kept getting asked, you know, Jim, you know, Jim, you've got all these great books and tons of concepts that you go over, but could you distill it together in one cohesive framework, right? And that is the outcome that you see here, which is called the map. And this, to me, I think is one of the most platinum level things as an entrepreneur that I have discovered that gives me a North Star, a guiding light to operate from. And it's around these, these key frameworks. So he took all the key principles from his books and then dropped them into this framework, disciplined people. Disciplined thought, disciplined action, and being built to last. And if you do those four stages, right, the outputs are superior results, distinctive impact, and lasting endurance. And so if you're familiar at all with Jim Collins, these will look familiar. Level five leadership, confront the brutal facts, hedgehog concept, flywheel, and so forth. And if you click on each of these, right, it has a really tight little summary of the concept. It has little snippets of videos that are less than 60 seconds long, and then has very short articles that drill down on that concept. Um, and so the curriculum that we ended up building, you know, for those that don't want to go reread the books, is I basically went through this entire map and these like links and videos and create a curriculum that would take you and your teams through all of his frameworks and just linking back to these specific little articles and videos that cover all the concepts uh, pretty tightly. So I would highly recommend you go here and on right here at the top, you'll see a animated summary and then a in-depth teaching moment. You click on that, and in 22 minutes, Jim Collins takes decades of research and what he's distilled from seven books down to these frameworks and walks you through this whole map concept. I actually make every single brand new employee that joins our company watch this so they understand this is the framework on which we operate and how we've kind of built and grown, uh, grown our company. So this discovery, Jim Collins, his books, and specifically this map concept is gonna be the basis for what we're gonna dive in here today. Dan, are you about to say something? Yeah, thank you. Um you know, Jim Collins is one of the incredible gurus uh, of business. And my biggest issue with him, honestly, I mean, I love the books. I used to read these is he's talking about the most successful companies in the world and lessons that you can draw, like generalized ways in which they behaved that allowed them to be 10x their comp competition. But the companies he was talking about were the largest and most successful companies in the world. And so I always discounted the books. I always said, this is not for me, this is for Microsoft. This is for a Fortune 500 company. And what honestly Brad opened my eyes to is that no, these are timeless principles of good business leadership that can apply to any sized company. And I literally not realized or thought about that until he shared that with me. And so, Today is a really special session because uh, more than almost anyone, Brad has taken the principles that Jim Collins, through his research, has unearthed from the greatest performing companies, and then he's distilled them to a small business context, limited in time, money, and expertise, and applied them to his own business to incredible effect. So... It's a real treat to have you here. You're a you're a practicing business owner who has read books and then spent the time figuring out how to apply this in a in a smaller business context. And really looking forward to taking this journey with you. Well, thanks for the clarification and sharing on that, uh, Dan. And uh, and and that was honestly the same take I had initially, right? Especially my twenties, young, inexperienced entrepreneur. You know, I just immediately discounted when I started reading Good to Great and it's talking about those big, big companies. I just same thing, right? Um, but looking at it through a more experienced entrepreneur and and leader, you know, twenty years later almost, um, it, it just shows you the level of, of maturity that kind of gathered through through the years and how that these could absolutely apply 
um, to me as a small business owner. And, and I'll tell you that the trap, you know, to comment on something on this topic as well, I think the trap that a lot of entrepreneurs typically fall into is they end up getting into consumption overload. And it's easier to go to that next podcast, go to that conference, go sit down and listen and get endorphin hits off the next information when they haven't executed and implemented that whole laundry list of things, closets stacked full of notebooks from the 19 other conferences that they went to. Right. <laughs> and so I encourage everyone here, you know, is sometimes it's as entrepreneurs, we're dealing with a lot of challenges and struggles. And instead of going and dealing with those challenges and doing the hard work and executing the proven frameworks we've already learned, you know, it's easier. Let me just go learn something new. And it's easier to get a win there and go be around my fellow entrepreneurs and all the oxygen in the room. Right. I'm not saying we don't all need that, but it's taking time to actually implement and execute what you have kind of in front of you. And so that's what I've tried to do as well is, you know, I, and I still read a lot of books and content, engage a lot of stuff. Um, but I try to really stick to a lot of things that I, that I learned in this framework with Jim Collins. Uh, a lot of it, if I can just stick to this and execute this really, really well, it's going to translate, you know, you know, strongly for us, which it has in our results, which I'll, I'll share as we kind of go through. Um, and so I went live and kind of showed you this, but this is just a slide with a screenshot of that, you know, this map. Um, and so again, just encourage you to go on that, look at that map and then watch both that animated summary and also uh, that, that teaching moment with, with Jim live kind of walking you through it. And I think you'll see that whether you are a, a one person lemonade stand or, you know, GE general electric, you'll see how this stuff applies no matter what. And, and to be honest, it may not, some of it may not have directly apply with where we are. Like, you're like, Hey, I got two people. Why am I worried, you know, about, uh, you know, first two, then what is because you always want to keep operations and these kind of things ahead, right? Be several steps ahead so that you're prepared to grow into it. Cause so many entrepreneurs, they just get in a reactive state perpetually. And so instead of getting ahead of the game and preparing themselves, like we'll talk about return on luck here, um, is they're just reactive as things come, right? So in our business specifically, which I'll talk about with outsource access, we could honestly be at about 2,000 employees today if I wanted to in four years, right? Right. But my intentional, based on some of these frameworks, was I constantly wanted to have operations and our ability to provide talented VAs and staff out of the Philippines ahead of what our sales were. Because if I didn't, I would trash our reputation, right? So it was making an intentional decision. So to the point of this quote on the left, Right. This is one of my favorites from Jim Collins is greatness is not a function of circumstance. Greatness, it turns out, is largely a matter of conscious choice and discipline. Right. It's us making specific, intentional, disciplined choices day by day that translate into the long term effect. Right. And that, that that's a bit of what we'll talk about on 20 Mile March. Right. It's doing consistent things over and over again. Um, and this is just another another view of this uh, exact same map. There's a couple different versions he has on his on his website. Um and, and this is what uh, Dan you know, referenced uh, briefly as well, is if, if you're interested, again, when I dove deep into this, being president of EO Atlanta at that time and then growing this business, I said for myself and for my own teams and actually my board that I was over for EO Atlanta uh, at that time, you know, offering them values, I, I took and, and took his whole map concept and I created an entire curriculum. This is just a little snapshot of the front page of it. Uh, that's basically a four month, you know, to make it super bite size. That kind of breaks these up into into bite sized components, and then it has even has pre made emails that you can actually send to your team that link to the relevant topics and articles all on Jim Collins' uh, site. Right, this isn't you know, driving anything related to us and outsource access. This is truly just all about Jim Collins and um, and how to take this concept and make it bite sized Because to ask all of you to go read you know seven books from scratch <laughs> probably isn't going to happen tomorrow. But this breaks it up into and his website does a great job of distilling the key concepts from every book into these tight articles and videos. Uh, so again, just send an email at tools at outsourceaccess.com, put BizHack subject line, happy to send that to you along with a bunch of other resources. All right, so let's get into the key principles, right? So I'm going to drum, drive through these. And what I'm going to do is just describe the concept very high level. And then I want to give you, you know, one, maybe two specific examples, right? Because as entrepreneurs, and I found, and I've got a chance to do a bunch of speaking globally on the whole world of outsourcing. I do these three-hour workshops on, on how to integrate outsourcing into your business. And what I found is people like specific application and case study. Um, so uh, instead of just sharing the concept, I'm going to share a specific takeaway example that we'll kind of run through here. And Dan and I will interact a bit. And as things strike him or wants to interrupt me and pause me so we can make this an interactive dialogue so you shall hear my voice nonstop for the 90 minutes. Uh, Dan and I'll be adding a little texture as we run through this together. Stage one, right? So as you saw the three stages, it starts with disciplined people. And, and I'd like to just say at the beginning, an overarching theme around all of this is discipline, right? The word discipline is disciplined people, disciplined thought, disciplined action leads to lasting results, right? And, and that's truly what fundamentally this is about, right? 
there's a reason why only 4% of businesses in the United States, right, plus or minus, get over a million dollars. Only 4%, guys. There's over 30 million small businesses in the United States. Only 4% get over a million dollars. You want to know why? The vast majority is because lack of discipline a lot of times. It's a lack of doing the things that you need to do to grow and scale and expand to get beyond that million dollar mark, right? And so the reason why, right, if everybody would be doing it, it'd be easy. Uh, so it's being disciplined in your approach and consistency. So stage one is discipline people, level five leadership. And the concept that he talks about in the book, and again, this is all rooted in all of the analysis and research he did of many, many, many companies, right? Not Jim's opinion, but of strong, rigorous analysis is he talks about there's these five levels of leadership, right? And again, I'm not going to go into super detail on all of these, and you can go back and look on the site and, and get in, into, into each one. But to distinct the last two levels, the difference between level four, right? And he talks about level one, two, three, and four. You're competent. You're a manager. You can oversee small groups of people and so forth. You get to level four. You're just you know a higher level of leadership, right? You're competent. You're, you're managing a team. But the difference between level four and level five is humility. Right. And when he found the most high performing companies out there, and again, this applies to General Electric and it applies to your one man band business that you're just starting. Right. And the reason why Jay Sell and I, she and I were the only two employees in Outsource Access. Now we're 504 years later. And the reason, one of the main reasons why is humility, which I'll talk about here, um, is it's doing it for something greater than yourself. Right. You know, fundamentally, human beings, it's about they just want to be recognized that they exist. And they want to know that they're a part of, they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And so what Collins found in a lot of the companies that he studied was the level five leaders that really took it to the next level, that, that went to that next tier of level five versus level four, is it wasn't about them. It wasn't about their ego. It wasn't about them having, you know, their accolades all over, all over everything and being the biggest, most boisterous voice. It was about the bigger cause, the purpose of the company, what you're trying to accomplish and the people involved, right? So that's level five leadership. And, you know, to bring the example and outsource access, right, is uh, this right here, which you'll see. So Jay Sell, that young woman right there beside me, and that's actually her husband now third, uh, who wasn't her husband when we first started. That was her boyfriend. But she was my very first VA that I hired in the Philippines when I started to go down this path. I've been doing outsourcing for years. I wanted to get my own personal VA, hadn't had one. People told me about the Philippines, English speaking, Americanized culture, went on a job board, found her. And at 23 years old, um, found her um, through just a job board in the Philippines. And she lived in a small town in the southern part of the Philippines. And we started working together. And I just got to know her. I got to know her. I got to know about her, her family. I got to know about where her goals were. I paid her well. I took care of her. I invested in her growth and her development. Um, she saw that I was about something more than just making money in my business, right? And at the time, I was just doing a lot of consulting and speaking around outsourcing. We hadn't launched our own outsourcing company. Um, and uh, and so, and she gave the same back to me, right? So it was about investing in one another. And a couple of months after working together, she sent me this picture. She said, Brad, and uh, this this picture of these two young, you know, this young Filipino children here um, in a bit of a kind of low income village you know, situation in this circle of shoes. And she said, Brad, I want you to know because the money that I've made because of working for you and you paying me at the level you're paying, I was actually able to go buy these shoes for these children and go deliver it to them and take them to them for these kids that got to walk an hour and a half back in school to every day. Right. So that started our journey of investing in one another. And it wasn't just about growing a profitable outsourcing education consulting business. Right. Here I was getting someone that was helping me and helping me grow in an affordable way that I couldn't afford otherwise. And then she was doing so well that she then paid it back into her community as well. So it started off of this level five leadership mentality that she saw for me from the beginning is I wasn't just trying to arbitrage labor and take advantage of a low cost situation. I was trying to help her grow and develop and therefore she in turn paid it back in her community. And I'll share with you just a brief video here. This now became a staple. This was just when it was just two employees with she and I. And now it's become a part of our entire mantra of our business. Every quarter, we survey our employees. We ask what they care the most about. And we've done everything from provide hygiene kits for people affected by earthquakes to planting hundreds of trees to offset carbon emissions um, to one of my trips over. We actually did a whole village. And I said, let's take the shoe buying thing to another level, j -Cell. And so we had these children measure their feet. And we went and delivered over 100 pairs of shoes to children. So I'll show you a quick little 60-second video.
chairs to the out so we knew the exact size as far as you know we get the right shoes for which is kind of pretty cool um, and we have with them for what we call our Meyer Global Journal uh, these kids are looking for elevating and growing in their lives and um, so we uh, give them something they can kind of keep track of their journey and their goals and dreams and what they're looking to do uh, going ahead we'll be sharing with them here shortly but that was kind of cool So just give you a little insight, right? And even on my recent trip, I just got back from the Philippines for 10 days and uh, we took it up to another level and we went and gave 150 pairs of brand new school shoes to a bunch of children there and actually investing in their school and helping develop and growth. So point being is that in your business, when your employees see that you're a part of something bigger than just profit from a business standpoint um, and how you show up, right? And I even write personal welcome messages to every single VA that joins our company. Even to this day, as CEO with 500 employees, we bring people on. I write personal welcome messages one-on-one -on -one to every single staff that joins so that they feel recognized. They feel that, hey, the CEO actually knows what I'm doing, that I that I exist and that I'm adding value, right? And every single time I hear something great, I send a personal message to them. If I see one of our clients when I'm traveling, I shoot a little selfie video with them and I send them a personal message. They overflow, right, with just novels of response to me on how the impact that that makes for them. Um, and so, you know, these are a couple of awards. Real Leaders is the official uh, magazine for YPO and uh, and recognizes high impact leaders and, and organizations. And Inc. Best in Business, they came out with a whole new award Inc. did for companies that are not just growing, but also having a huge impact in their communities. So we won both of these awards for that. Uh, we give our employees a chance to not just give accolades to them, but we have this thing called How I Did It. So we give them accolades. And then in front of our entire company, we ask them, tell us how you pulled it off. Right. And this is a little tip I would share with all of you. Anytime you give accolades, I don't care if it's to your children or to your employees, a lot of times it's one way. It's like, Dan, great job. You did a phenomenal job in this whole big biz hack series. So proud of you. Wonderful. Right. And then it usually stops there. But what if I pause and say, Dan, tell me, how'd you pull it off, man? How did you do this and get through COVID and make this thing whole thing, this thing happen? I'm now giving Dan a platform, you know, to showcase and, and let him share with me how he pulled it off and made it happen. Does two things. A, makes him feel really good about the opportunity to share. And then B, I get to see what, how is he seeing, you know, his opportunity in the lens of performance? And so when our employees, we just promoted somebody to an operations director in the Philippines. And uh, I, you know, did the same thing, you know, Hey Jane, great job. You just got promoted to operations. Um, you know, how'd you pull it off? How'd you do it? She wrote a novel and she ended up writing this whole dissertation in quotes from Henry Ford, right? So here's a young woman that grew up in a small village in the Philippines. That's quoting Henry Ford, right? So it gave us as owners and business owners insight of like, what are they seeing? Is is the stuff hitting home with them that we're trying to do and grow and develop our team? So we actually have a whole book called a How I Did It Culture Book where we capture those answers from all our employees. So when we go to an interview employees to come on board with us, we don't just send them, hey, here's our mission, our core values on bullet points. We say, hey, read this. These are employees in their own words telling us back how they pulled off growing and excelling in our company and how it happened, right? It's been a wildly significant thing for us. And guys, even to the point of showing how much we care, it's not just about us, is that our employees, especially in the Philippines, is they're a part of little micro entrepreneur opportunities with their with their families. I mean, the, you know, the Philippines is a huge micro entrepreneur community. You know, people have little tiny stores that they launch of how they make a living. And so we've even decided that we're going to launch a whole entrepreneurship education for our staff that if they want to become entrepreneurs, and even if that means leaving us at outsource access to start their own business or help their family, we're okay with that. Right. One of our core values is everlong quest for improvement and becoming a 2.0 version of yourself. So we're even creating a path for people to leave us as employees if we can help them to a better path for them and their families. Right. So it's truly living and breathing that level five mentality. Right. And I still fail on it all day long, but we try to live up to that humility concept as we push through. You know, um, that's kind of that. Be, uh, yeah. One thing is um, just as a, as a process note, I, um, updated the slides. Um, so if you could stop sharing and 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 uh, take them out of uh, screen share and then reshare them, the updates will be reflected. Um, second okay. is um, we have a Q&A, uh, uh, guys, uh, where you can ask questions if you had any specific questions. Um, also, the email is not fools at outsourceaccess.com but tools with the t i love that um i think that's like that's uh, casimir i don't know if you did that on purpose but that is hilarious and i love it 
uh, but it's not fools, it's tools with a T. And, and then finally, I wanted to I wanted to reflect on what you said about level five leadership and humility. Uh, there's a technique called NAN, N-A-N, noticed, affirmed, needed. Whenever you give praise, you want to make sure that people feel noticed, affirmed, and needed in the praise. So for instance, Brad, I see how hard you worked on these slides. I know you just traveled from the Philippines and that you spent most of your flight back working on these slides. Noticed, affirmed. The slides are really well done, very thoughtful, very um, some, some of the best slides any presenter has ever put forth for us. Needed. You know, I've never met somebody who has taken the time to figure out Jim Collins for his small business and then also is willing to give of his time to... Uh, share that knowledge so freely. Thank you. Love it. How does that land when you hear yourself being noticed, affirmed, and needed? It feels a you know a, a level of observation that you don't normally you know get from individuals, right? It's a it's it's a taking time to not just high level give appreciation, which anybody can do, but put 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 more thoughtfulness in that delivery. Yeah, the biggest difference is a lot of times when we praise our team, it actually doesn't have the intended effect. And the reason why was like, hey, guys, great job. Nice work. That's almost worse yeah. than not saying anything. It's it's when you, you when you notice them, you affirm them and they sh you tell them that they're needed when the impact is great. And it's exactly, Brad, what you were describing. So uh, I don't yeah. want to talk too long, but uh, would love to go to stage one disciplined people. First, who, then what? Surely. And the only the only thing I would add, and I don't know which acronym would make it still work, but I would I would then offer kind of a, a how component to that, right? So you gave me one one way, noticed, affirmed, and needed, but then give me a platform to share back, right? And that's the the one additional element that that we found with this is uh is giving people a chance to articulate, you know, articulate back. And I'm telling you, it will surprise you what your employees, and I even did it with my daughter in, in, in softball, right? I learned this from Bern Harnish, one of the founders of EO. He's the one that told us this concept of how I did it. And I'm like, you know, I normally congratulate her. What a great hit she had in softball. Great job fielding the ball. And then I stopped there. So she had a great game. She had amazing hit. She's got the winning out at second base. And, I, and on the ride home, I was like, Ella, amazing job. I said, but how'd you pull it off? You know, how'd you do that under the pressure? And she started unpacking for me in a way I didn't even realize, right? Well, dad, remember that thing you bought for us in the driveway that we spent for an hour and a half doing that? Like, that's what I thought of. And then I saw my friend Jane, I saw how focused she was and she held the bat in a certain way. And I wanted to try that. So that's how I pulled that off, right? You get to hear back in a way and it helps you then be a better parent, being a better coach, being a better CEO, because now you're hearing the lens through which they're absorbing stuff in a way you didn't even think about. So can apply in your personal life as, as well. Uh, all right, so the second part of disciplined people is the first two, then what, right? And I'll go relatively quickly because it's a lot of the similar kind of concepts here. Um, but at the end of the day, what he talks about in the books and all the studies, and a lot of you have found is that, and, and, and you all know, you know, if you've got employees like this, it's just those people who get it, right? Who get it, who want it, and have the capacity. We use this framework in EOS, which I'll talk about, but it's called GWC, right? And so it's all about, first of all, who do you have on your bus with you, right? And if I could go back to myself in my early 20s, this is the number one thing I would tell myself is that when I'm going to hire some of my first employees, don't skimp on the compensation. Don't go for the cheaper person, right? Go for the person that can get the job done, that's going to get up and run through a wall because that's how they're built, right? Not because of how they're motivated by compensation or me driving them and moving them ahead, right? Um and so, you know, this is that concept, right? Get the right people in the bus before any else, right? Because you end up creating, right? And I still make these mistakes myself, right? I still think I've measured 10 times and cut once, right? I'm a huge fan of that. Measure, 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 assessments, evaluation before I choose, um, but still can make some, some missteps. And that costs you so much in terms of frustration, mental agony, and what have you, when you have somebody falling short and you're constantly thinking about it when you're not thinking about it, about the, the, the shortcomings. So just work on getting the right people. Be willing to pay that premium to get the right people who you just know are going to run with things, right? Um, and ultimately, as, as Collins discovered, it's that they're not ultimately motivated by compensation, perks, or benefits, but belief in the mission, right? The right people aren't the ones. And he, and he looked at a lot of the key executives and a lot of the highest performing companies that he studied. And compensation, in fact, they were actually lower compensated than some of the standards in the industry. They believed in the mission of the business, right? And the mission of what you're doing. So Jay Sell, just like with me, she believed in the mission of what we were trying to accomplish, right? Um, and the same thing we're doing with our employees. 
They wake up every day and give the extra mile because that's what they were built to do. Okay. These are people that wake up, they want to perform, they want to execute because they believe in you and they believe in the mission and they're going to go above and beyond. They're going to spend that extra time and effort. Not that you're trying to overwork people beyond 40 hours a week and so forth, but it's because they love what they do so much in the mission that they're going to do that and go above and beyond. You know, and I'd like to highlight, you know, one of our employees that, that came on with us this past year that, that, that is an epic example of this. Uh, this is Mary. You'll see here on the left. And as I said, I just came back from the Philippines 10 day trip there. And I just had this idea when I went, I got a chance when we won the Inc 5000, got a chance to go to the gala in San Antonio, that this really cool red carpet experience. And, uh, and I got a chance to be interviewed on the red carpet and so forth. And, you know, I'm the, I'm the only one here in the US, right? I mean, my whole team's in the Philippines. And I was like, how can we bring this back to our, to our team? And so Mary, who recently joined us, and I sent over and I said, hey, can we replicate this red carpet experience for our employees and, and, and do kind of this, uh, you know, team, this leadership summit, right? The best employees, you know, when you have the first two, then what is when you can give the vision and the idea, they take it and can deliver. I come and we deliver. Mary put together in the team, our whole HR team, which we've rebranded to people and culture, put this unbelievable epic leadership summit that was, I mean, Oscar night quality, red carpet, got plaques made for all of our employees with Inc. 5000 um, and delivered this unbelievable high end experience throughout the entire journey. Right. And she did several of these while I was there. So. She is the essence of first to them what. When I think about a 10 out of 10 world-class leader, Mary hits the spot, right? She gets it. She loves it. She bleeds. She literally wears her outsource access ID around all the entire time I was there. She doesn't have to swipe a single thing to get into anywhere or need her ID. She just wears it on her neck with her outsource access strap because she loves our company and what we stand for. So look for those people that are going to wake up, run through a wall because they're passionate about your business and what you do and your mission, and everything else will take care of itself. So first two then what, All right? So that kind of concludes the you know, disciplined people thought. So I'll jump into stage two, disciplined thought, genius of the end. Dan, any comments on that before I jump in? No, you're doing great. All right. So once you got the right people on the bus, right? Focus on getting the right people. And that includes yourself, right? You got to get yourself in the right mindset that you're going to tackle this entrepreneurial journey, right? Um, and it, it is... It, it's a, a lot of you have heard, and it's a cliche book out there called The E-Myth, right? And a lot of you, and if you're a first-time entrepreneur, or even if you're a seasoned entrepreneur, I can't recommend going back to that and maybe reading it twice a year. Because if you're going to be a part of that that, that not 4% that can exceed a million dollars per year, you've got to learn how to get out, work on, and scale the business, right? And make sure you've got the right mindset for that. Or basically, you've done nothing but create a job for yourself. You haven't created a company that's allowing you to scale and been, you know, enjoy the benefits of it. So getting the right people on the bus it's finding the right people to surround you, but you've got to be in the right place too. You got to be in the right mindset, the right discipline to be able to, you know, take on the, the challenge. So once we have that, then you jump into stage two, which is discipline thought, right? And there's a couple of components to this. The first one is genius of the and, right? And this is a little bit contradictory, okay? Than most of us have heard it a lot of times, but the the point being is is that it's rejecting the tyranny of the or, right? It is a lot of times it's like, well, I, if we do this, we can't have that, right? Right. And this isn't to say you don't need to focus in certain areas and do certain things, right, and, and kind of block out distractions, but it's the idea that you can have both things kind of in your business if you put the right systems in process and you have the right people on the bus, right? You can embrace both extremes, as Collins talks about on his website. You can have purpose-driven with what you're doing, but also be profitable. You can have continuity, right? Continue like continuity of what's working in your business, but also stimulate change, you can have discipline, right, and rigorous discipline and focus, but also have creativity, right? So this is something that he found that was prevalent in a lot of the good to great companies, you know, and for us, a perfect example of it, right? And I'll explain, there's two stages of this, but when we started our company and I launched this right before COVID, okay, we launched in 2019, you know, launching right before a global pandemic where I saw certain industries get crushed, okay, is I was initially, because what you learn in business, right, is focus, 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 get niched in certain industries, go deep in those industries. And to be honest, like I actually had a lot of a lot of presence in the commercial real estate space. I just spoken at a huge global conference in DC for commercial real estate. It was a natural fit for VAs and outsourcing and what we did. Um, we were about to go deep in that space. And I strategically chose, right, you know what? We are going to create a system and process so that we can have and, right? We can go big and grow but we can also be diversified in many different industries so that I can go to sleep at night knowing that if another COVID hits, that I'm not going to see 80% of my business disappear, 
right? So the genius of the and for us was, yes, we can both go into multiple industries and not have to just focus on one. And secondly, we can do and service all business functions within those industries. So currently, we're in over 70 different industries that we built the base of our business on. 500 employees, you know, I mean, hundreds of account clients that we're working with and everything from financial services to global speakers to concrete manufacturing firms to insurance agencies to everything in between, right? And we do all functions within those business. We support marketing, operations, customer service, bookkeeping, and finance. Most people look on the outside and they there's no way you can do that. Unless you focus, you can't possibly have done that. We did it and we did it in the middle of COVID and we had to do it virtually. Guys, I wasn't even able to go back to the Philippines for three years. I went over there in 2019 before we launched, and I had to run and build this company with JCL remotely for three years, right? And still grow to our pace. So we were able to do that. And I showed now long term, right? And I'll explain this isn't our strategy long term, but near term, I wanted to create a solid, diversified new base that was not dependent on one particular industry or one function, so that if something happened, right, we had a defendable position so we weren't going to get wiped out. Right. Something happened to the concrete industry and all of a sudden price of, you know, materials went through the roof. OK, I lose one point five percent of my business, not 80 percent. Something gets wiped out in commercial real estate. I don't lose 72 percent of my business. I lose two percent. Right. So we embrace the genius of the end, but. We had to be specific about our processes and our approach that would allow us to service this many industries and be very diversified in the services that we were offering. The other genius of the end was is that. You know, how are you going to let people work from home in the Philippines, right? What, what about internet? What about stability? What about their ability, you know, because a lot of them have their children at home or a lot of them actually have their family members that live at home with them a lot of times. How are you going to make that work, right? Well, launching right before COVID, we were about to sign an office space and go the traditional route. We had everybody in an office in the Philippines. And actually, I met with my forum and EO, and uh, they convinced me to pause on, on signing that lease and said, okay, can we do this? Can we grow this fast and let our employees work from home and still deliver value to our clients? And it has been one of the absolute best things we've ever done because when other outsourcing BPO companies were getting crushed because they didn't know how to do the work from home model, right? We had done it from the beginning. So we did the genius of the end, right? We were able to scale, grow, make sure our staff had the internet and could deliver value and have the right working environment and still make our clients super happy. You know, this picture right here is a K you can see at the top there, you know, and it's created, it, it, what it did was it gave us access to talent that we wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Because we got people that could work from us remote that couldn't drive into to offices. So we got better talent and we got to let them be with their families. You can see pictures here of, of them with their, you know, with their children. Uh, this is Kay with their, with their children there at home. Uh, and this is their client, you know, the Shotwells, who have a video production company that we changed their life by adding Kay to them. They started, she started doing social media, then she started doing their bookkeeping for them, then she started handling logistics with all their clients. So it was the genius of the end. We could scale, we could grow, allow people to work from home and have both have our cake and kind of eat it too. Sure, you know, I love this say. idea of both end versus either or thinking. Yep. Um, if you guys start listening for this in your life, you're going to hear all the time people frame things as either this or that. And if you just get into a habit of taking that either or and just turning it into it, could both be true? Uh, and uh, could we do something else and so if you could kind of break that frame of uh that, that we tend to put things with either or and, and and start into a more of a both end generative approach uh not just for your business but for your personal life you'll see incredible results absolutely and it's it, and on the concept of purpose and profit right i mean you know we, we are a for-profit entity right but we chose from the beginning that we wanted to give back and have a huge impact. I got a chance to speak on the floor of the United Nations headquarters because of EO with 200 entrepreneurs from all over the world to learn how we could understand the United Nations sustainable development goals and how we could implement those in our in our business. And so a lot of people that have for-profit businesses, they're like, hey, I'd like to have more impact and give back, but, I, but I'm, not a, I'm not a nonprofit. I'm not a social enterprise. Well, you absolutely can, right? It's just getting your employees involved. And so we we got our employees and surveyed them and said, hey, what do you care the most about? Life on land, life below sea, you know, economic growth, uh, you know, no hunger and got them involved. And so it's a part of our budget. And, and to be honest, it's what's helped us retain employees and it's helped us win clients because clients see that we're a part of giving back and having an impact in the community, right? So it's the right thing to do. I would do it regardless of any of that, but it absolutely has translated. And, and I tell you, when you're hiring young employees these days, right, if you don't have a purpose outside of profit for what you're doing, you know, you're not going to attract the young employees these days because they care more about purpose and impact than, than, than any other generation. 
All right, so I'll jump to the next portion of discipline thought, which is confront the brutal facts, okay? And <laughs> I can't say this one enough, and I use this phrase quite a bit, um, and it's not sugarcoating, right? And it's this concept based on this, it's called the Stockdale Paradox, all right? And again, I won't go into a super tremendous amount of, of detail here, but it's based on General Stockdale, back in history, I can't remember which war it was, but it was kind of in a, he was a prisoner of war, and, you know, he was able to survive and get through to be able to be released, and there was others that didn't make it through, right? And hopefully I'm not batching this because I haven't looked back at the story for quite some time, but the point was, is it's because the idea of is that you have complete confidence that you're going to be successful in the end, but you must confront the brutal facts in front of you. Right. And if you don't own those and come to terms with them and address them, then you're never going to get on the other side. And, you know, what General Stockdale was to say, look, I just got to face the brutal facts of the absolute awful situation that we're in. And it may not be two, three, four, five years before this is going to end. I'm going to believe I'm going to be successful and be released in the end, but I'm not going to have this fake hopium. Right. And a lot of us as entrepreneurs can get completely drunk on this hopium concept. Right. And we don't want to fake. We fall in love and with our own idea, right? But we don't take time to go crunch the numbers and run a financial model and say, could this actually make money? Is there economics in here, right? I'm just passionate about making these widgets, and I don't care if it makes money or not. It's just what I want to do. So it's facing the brutal facts. It's tossing the rose-colored glasses. It's keeping your head out of the sand because a lot of times we just don't want to face the facts. You know, We don't want to look and say that our baby is ugly, right? So it's it's a critical concept, and I've used this many, many times with, within our business, that we got to face the brutal facts. Look, I have no doubt we're going to continue to grow and be successful, but we've got to own the challenges we're dealing with right now and fix them and address them now and don't let them keep sliding through. You know, So I'll share with you, in contrast to what I shared on Genius of the End, okay, is, is that in order for us to hit our next stage of growth, okay, so we built our business you know, across being in 75 different industries, doing everything for all these different businesses, very, very diversified, okay? But for us to grow to our next level, okay, and it's in, in part of me engaging a, a CEO coach as well, and again, I don't think I speak to this directly in any of this, but surround yourself with mentors and coaches. Constantly get people outside of being in the weeds of your own life who can look at you through another, another lens. And, uh, and so CEO coach working with as well, that's kind of validated for this for me, who's been in this industry for a while is that Brad, you're never going to get to that next tier of growth. Okay. Until you look at going after larger clients and you focus on some specific industries and you focus on specific functions within those industries. Right. And I intentionally chose, right. And I knew, and I'm fine with where we are right now, because what this does is we have a highly sticky, strong recurring revenue base. That's very diversified across 75 different you know industries and so forth. Right. So I've got a good, healthy, psychologically safe base so that I don't mind my next tier of growth. If I'm going to go throw a bunch of effort into, for example, home health care, right? A lot of home health care companies that provide in-home nurses for indigent and uh, low-income individuals. We've ended up finding some opportunity there. We got several clients that we've done really well with. That's one market that's growing, right? It's it's kind of recession proof. And so we're going to go deep in home health care, home health care companies that provide nurses and in-home care because we can provide a lot of support for them. And specifically within that industry, HR administration, right? Because these home healthcare companies have to deal with tons of HR functions, getting nurses, getting them interviewed, getting them deployed, getting them paid, tracking their hours and so forth. So we are now facing the brutal facts. Like at the end of the day, I know we're going to be successful and we're going to hit our target of 1,000, 2,000 people next couple of years. But the brutal facts are what we got did to get here isn't going to get us to the next stage, right? I would never trade it or change it, but that's the brutal facts we got to face. And so that's what we got to do to narrow down to scale and get to the next level. And so we've chosen five key industries, right? We're doing focus on real estate. We're focused on e-commerce, home healthcare, um, uh, uh, some specific in real estate. Um, and then we're narrowing specific functions in those business. And then we're focusing on specific functions that go across industries, including bookkeeping and this thing called sales acceleration, where we can take any sales team of any industry and help accelerate their efforts with a VA. And then third is uh, the franchising space, which I'll talk about in a second. So let's, let's talk about facts. one of the yeah. most brutal facts that I see in small business entrepreneurs is I, the owner, the founder, the visionary, and the limiter, limiter of growth in my company. And, um, you know, I, 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 one of the things that I love about entrepreneurship, but also it challenges me every day is, you know, when you're the founder of a company, you are that company, the company is a reflection of the best and often worst qualities of you. And you have to overcome that if you're going to scale. You have to get this company to be its own thing and not just a reflection of your id and your shadow. 
And uh, that's one of the hardest parts of the journey for me is, you know, I'm lucky enough to be good at a lot of things, but there's a lot of things I should have no business doing in my own business. And, you know, ironically enough, uh, often, and this is something that Vern Harnish talks about, but I've heard this advice given, the strengths of the owner are the weaknesses in her business, right? It's that kind of old adage about the, you know, the cobbler with the wooden shoe, the children with wooden shoes. You yep. know, the idea, the idea is that, you know, often when you're good at something, you say, oh, I can do that better than anybody I could hire or anyone I could afford to have do it. And I don't want to hire someone who can only do a mediocre job at it. I'm expert at that thing. But what ends up happening is your job as the CEO and the founder is not to do that thing. Your job is to grow the business, to build big relationships, to lead, to set a vision. And so if you're like, I'm going to get to the marketing because I'm really good at marketing, but it's always going to be a manana situation. And so you just have to own the fact that you are the inhibitor of your own growth. And I would say we work with many, many companies very closely. And the CEOs are more often than not the thing that's holding them back. And it's their lack of humility of understanding that that's what's happening that makes it almost impossible for them to succeed. And it's crazy because the same things that got you here won't get you there. So that same grit, determination, willingness to work hard that got you to the million dollar mark will stop you from getting to the $2 million mark. And so what's really hard is you have to be uh, able to shift when you go into a new phase in business from doing it yourself, which was a positive, to having hiring others to do it for you and leading them, which is a different skill set entirely. No, well said. And those are, those are all central to the mindset shift I talk about, right? First two, then what? It starts with, you know, the first two is your mindset as the owner to get in the right seat. Um, and actually you triggered a thought, and this is, this is one of the tools that we'll send you guys. If you send an email to that is a, and a great place to start with figuring out what do I need to get off of my plate? So actually, you know, this is a template that we share with people to kind of begin the journey of really asking yourself two questions, right? Is, what are you currently doing that you feel is not the best use of your time? List the task and how many hours you spend doing it. And then secondly, what are the things on the radar, right, as a business owner that I want to be doing that I should be getting to that I'm not due to time, money, resource, or knowledge constraints? And so I'll send you guys a link to this whole template uh, as well. It is a great, simple – when we start everything from startups to $100 million businesses, we'll send this simple two-question exercise and say, hey, you as the owner, send this to all of your staff. Have them dump, brain dump all their answers to these two questions, and we're going to meet in a week and come back. And it is amazing, Dan. People will come back with a list of 58 things, right? So it takes the discipline to kind of sit down and do this exercise. But when people, it's eye-opening every time. It's like, well, how many hours do I spend chasing down receivables for clients in my own business? Uh, actually, now I did it. It's about 11 hours per month. Well, if I repurpose that 11 hours to sales activities as the owner, which is I should be doing, right, what does that translate into? Um, so anyway, just triggered a thought there. It's a great little two question exercise and a template. We'll happy to share with you guys to, you can kind of go through to that exact point. What do you need to be getting kind of off of your plate and focus on that brings you the highest and best use? Um, All right. Quick, so jump if you don't mind, sorry, if you don't mind, uh, yeah. unsharing and then sharing again, uh, like, uh, Oh, sure. There you go. I just, uh, perfect. Thank you. No problem. Um, all right. So that's the other part of this one thought, right? And so I spent a little bit more time on the front end of this because these are some of the key foundation elements, right? Um, and in terms of timing here, I'll kind of click on through. So stage two, right? So stage one, again, first two, then, you know, discipline people, discipline thought, right? The next concept in discipline thought is the hedgehog concept, right? Um, so we talked about genius of the end. We talked about Stockdale paradox, um, hedgehog concept. And this is, again, something that a lot of times we struggle as entrepreneurs. And this comes back to the, you know, 75 industry thing for us um, is the idea is why the hedgehog? And, and what Collins talks about in his book is the fox, he compares the hedgehog to the fox. And the fox is always coming up with these crafty, new, innovative, reactive, nonstop ways to try and win to catch their prey, right? But the hedgehog does one thing really well. It rolls up in a ball, right? It knows what it's good at, how it's going to be effective, and does it, right? It rolls up in a ball, right? And so the hedgehog concept overall is trying to figure out what is that thing you do really well? What are you deeply passionate about what can you be the best in the world at and then what best drives your economic engine right so it's really asking yourself those three questions and the intersection of that is really where you end up kind of teasing out what is your hedgehog concept 
and, and a really important distinction to make that I, that I, that I took from this is the hedgehog concept. It's not about a goal to be the best or a strategy to be the best or an intention, right? It is an understanding, an understanding of what you can be the best at. The distinction is absolutely crucial, right? So a lot of us kind of fake ourselves into thinking what we can be the best in the world at, right? It's truly understanding you, who you are, what your skill sets are, what the opportunity is that, that you can be the best at and why, right? Not, not that, hey, I want to be the best marketing agency, but what can you uniquely be that's different and be the best in the world at relative to your competitors, right? So for us, and interesting, you know, this whole conversation, this whole you know, presentation from Dan and I sparked from, because I actually wrote an article for Inc. Magazine sh sharing how we use Jim Collins principles in growing. So this is kind of an exp just an expansion of that. Um, why it's worth revisiting these four timeless principles. And I'll send you guys a link to this article as well. And you see the picture of the hedgehog because it's one of the ones I talk about. But ours is leverage our unique understanding of the needs and motivations of entrepreneurs. Okay. And that comes from my end, right? I'm a US entrepreneur, been with my entire life. I live and breathe this whole world, right? I'm an EO for 10 years. I'm living and breathing around entrepreneurs nonstop. So I have, I bring to the table this unique understanding of the pain that we deal with, right? Then Jay Cell, who I brought from the Filipino world, grew up there. Right. So leverage our unique understanding of the needs and motivations of entrepreneurs and young, talent, talented Filipinos and bring both of them together for a long term, highly rewarding relationship. Right. So our hedgehog isn't to be the best outsourcing company in the world. It's how can we be unique understanding of the needs and wants of entrepreneurs, understand the motivations and talents of Filipinos and bring them together for a rewarding, highly rewarding long term relationship. Right. And so we have variations as we're kind of going through this, but I encourage you to all, what is your hedgehog concept? Get it succinctly defined. And what can you be the best in the world at and why? Uh, I'm going to interrupt leads. here because I'm so passionate yeah. about these next two concepts. I just want to weigh in for a second. I'm going to quickly sure. uh, share my screen. Um, and I want to show you um, the, one of the great innovators in business is Japan. Post-war Japan built an incredible set of techniques around lean manufacturing that turned Toyota into before Tesla, the largest and most valued company in the, in the, in the car world. Um, and it really wasn't until Tesla that we saw the kind of innovation that they built. That lean manufacturing approach was then borrowed by Silicon Valley and turned into the lean startup modality, agile, and, and, and much of the technological change was essentially inspired by Toyota. Um, similarly, there's another Japanese concept that is very similar to the hedgehog principle, and it's called Ikigai. And Ikigai is the intersection of what you love, what the world needs, what you can get paid for, and what you're good at. And so I love these two concepts of the hedgehog and Ikigai. You know, print this out, um, put this in a prominent place, and spend time thinking about the intersection of what you love, what the world needs, what the market wants, right? What your customers need, what you can get paid well to do and what you're uniquely qualified at. And if you can find that intersection, you're going to live such a fulfilled entrepreneurial life. And I will say that my Ikigai are these masterclasses. I, I love this. You guys need this. I've been lucky enough to find the county to sponsor it. And I think with my broadcast background and my curiosity and my deep and broad reading in business, I'm pretty good at it too. So, so I'm living my Ikigai right now with you guys, with you, Brad. And I just wanted to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to do that, to be my, uh, to live my hedgehog. Oh, absolutely. I'd love to be a part of it. And it's, it's a long journey for a lot of us. Right. And, and I'm, you know, we're also, you move that peg around a lot in life trying to figure out when is it going to drop, you know, and, and when you do, you feel it. And that's honestly why this company has grown as fast as it is. I mean, the business I've had in the past, you know, I, I was passionate about growing a business. I wasn't passionate about the subject matter. And, and I'm lucky enough in, in this you know particular industry um, to, to to talk about what I'm doing every single day, you know, in addition to grow, you know, to growing a business. Um, so it's an exciting, exciting journey to be in when you can you can land on it. But it is a never ending journey, right? You're never going to completely land on it. I think fully. Um, all right. So the next concept on disciplined action uh, is uh, the flywheel concept, right? And so this is also a, a key fundamental, right, uh, with Jim Collins. And I and I highly, highly recommend if you guys read nothing else or engage nothing else from Jim Collins. 
go look up on Amazon, turning the flywheel, right? It is a four, about a 45 minute where he has distilled just this flywheel concept into a 40 minute uh, audio book um, that, that just ties this tightly together so, so, so well. Um, but the concept of the flywheel, right? And a lot of you know what a flywheel is, right? A flywheel is kind of this thing that, you know, with motors and engines and so forth, you get it running, right? And it gets, and then it just kind of is on its own perpetual motion, right? So Jim Collins, and, and that's what in, motivated this entire journey for him many years ago when he was teaching, I think at Stanford, and he was trying to come up with his curriculum on teaching, is he said, let's, let's base this on what has built truly enduring long successful companies, not fly by nights, but enduring companies, right? And the flywheel is central to that is that in building great enduring companies, there is no single defining action, no grand program, no one killer innovation or one miracle moment, right? The process resembles relentlessly pushing a giant heavy flywheel turn upon turn, building momentum until a point of breakthrough and beyond, right? So, you know, a lot of us, you know, we think we're just going to have that knee jerk Fox type reaction, right? Of like, oh, this one, you know, random act of marketing or this, you know, one, you know, idea is going to solve all problems, right? As even as we've seen with the chat GPT, right? You know, Sam Altman got fired, then he got rehired again, right? It's like, oh, we came with this one innovation and all of a sudden it's going to solve all the world's problems, right? It's not, right? Even if you have a great innovation, a good technology or something that you found, you know, that, that is the basis of your business, it's, it's about constantly turning the flywheel, doing these incremental specific initiatives, right, to keep building the momentum going forward, right, and being super intentional about your discipline and not just thinking that, oh, it's all said and done, we've made it, right? It's, it's, it's a never-ending, and I can assure you where I'm at right now, you know, for us, it was, hey, 75 industries, very diverse, we got to see going to get us there, we've got to retool and focus on specific narrow ones that we're going to tackle going forward, right? And so I'll read through this in super detail. Again, this is recorded. You guys won't take a screenshot of this. You're welcome to. But I would encourage all of you, actually in my EO forum, uh, we, we challenged everybody in my forum to everybody to come to the meeting with their own flywheel. And, um, and so for us, it's kind of like, what, what are we doing in our business that is allowing us to move people through our journey that, is a, that creates a self-perpetuating engine, right? And for us, the first stage of the flywheel is having that unique understanding, you know, understanding the unique needs of an entrepreneur and of our Filipino kind of staff. And then once we understand that, have unique understanding, it allows us to create a custom sticky solution for our clients in a way that other people can't. And then once we do that, we create leverage. Our clients are blown away by the results. They're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea somebody from the Philippines could do this high level of a work. This is unbelievable. Then they realize their potential. Then all of a sudden they get ROI, right? It's how like Chip Dodd with the home healthcare company, he started with one personal VA. Now he has eight one for every single senior staff. And now it's created such a machine in his business that he's been able to launch, launch his own nonprofit. So he travels the world doing adventure racing and doesn't even have to manage the day-to-day, -day, right? Right. So it's creating that kind of experience and they do that, okay? Then they want to add more. It's like, hey, if I could get one, you know, for, you know, $20,000 for a full-time staff that adds our business, well, let's find ways we can add more, right? And then, because of that, they want to tell other people about it. And entrepreneurs love sharing things with other entrepreneurs. Guys, I finally found a company that got this outsourcing thing right. Amazing experience, great talent. L let me tell you about it, right? Guys, we still have not launched a national sales and marketing program because we haven't had to, right? Our flywheel has generated the majority of our business all from referral. Expansion of our existing clients. I mean, our largest client has 90 people with us, you know? And in uh, in adding from referral because people telling other people about us, we've made the customer the center of the journey, and by servicing them well, everything else takes care of itself. And then the next stage is gain a deeper understanding. So the more we dig deep with our clients, the more we understand them, we service them, we're doing things across multiple parts of their business, we get to know them better, understand them better. That then goes back and feeds the beginning stage, which is a deeper understanding, and we keep reinvesting that in understanding to go deeper, add more value to our clients, right? So it's created, and it's done the same thing for us on the VA side, right? So in addition to getting clients, we got to have VAs that can deliver. So every client we sign, we got to bring on a new VA because we've delivered amazing experience for our staff and our VAs. They've had an amazing experience. They've grown and learned. They see that we're a part of something bigger than ourselves. We've invested in their community. They tell their friends and family. I mean, we, sometimes I think I, when I was there last, uh, we had like nine family members that worked for us, right? They tell their friends, their families, their cousins, and so forth. You know, they post on their own social media. Right. We did that that red carpet event. All of them posted on their own social media about like, hey, look at my company. They just showcased me on a red carpet experience. And it's translated into a flywheel of us getting more and more talent. So now I've got two flywheels going. I've got clients. We're servicing them well. 
I could not add a single new client from a brand new source and just live off substantial ongoing 20, 30% growth per year, just from our existing client base. If we serve them well from expansion and referral, right? So I have a self-perpetuating flywheel there and I have a flywheel going on the VA side, on the talent side, right? So I'd encourage you take time to think about through. And again, look up that turning the flywheel, right? It's a small, I can't remember what it's called, Dan. It's called an epigraph. It's what they call something specifically. That's a small breakaway piece of a larger book uh, is what he calls it there. But it really dives into this concept. But you get this running, right? And you're not having to constantly, you know, chase new business, new projects and so forth. You know, you can create a flywheel to create a self-perpetuating engine in your business. You're on mute there, Dan. Um, I, I wanted to, sh I, I'm very excited about the flywheel concept. It's um, it's definitely more visible and easier to see in larger companies. So I did want to just, the, the, the classic flywheel that all of you will probably recognize is Amazon. Um, and it started, you remember, with the largest bookstore in the world, Selection, and then an obsession with giving like a really seamless buying experience, customer experience. That started to drive traffic. Uh, to Amazon. And that's where they were for many, many, many years. They were just the biggest bookstore and then they expanded into home goods and other things. But what actually made their flywheel turn was once they had enough traffic, they started to attract third party sellers who were willing to put their products on to Amazon's platform. Suddenly the selection skyrocketed. And then once they had enough growth and enough volume, that allowed that second flywheel to happen, which is the lower cost structure, the lower prices. And that's a huge part. Lower prices are a huge part of a great customer experience. And it was that flywheel that really turned Amazon into the behemoth it is today, 50% of all online shopping happening through them. It, it was that key element of adding third-party sellers that really allowed this flywheel to turn. Because what was actually happening is their traffic, uh, they weren't actually able to provide the selection that they needed in order to sustain and grow the traffic. And they had to come up with a creative solution that this side of the flywheel was broken until the third party sellers entered the picture. Yeah, making a note actually of that of uh, because I used to actually show the Amazon flywheel when I do my full presentation on this as well. Um, and I tell you, that's part of what got me really deep on on Collins is, is that was one of the biggest inflection points. Bezos flew Jim Collins out to their headquarters and he helped them develop their flywheel. And a lot of people don't know that, right? That was a big inflection point. So another great book out there is called Bezonomics. Um, and it's, it talks about in there, uh, it's a study of the whole Amazon model. And, you know, literally Jim Collins was a part of that, that equation for them, right? Um, flew him out and helped him figure out what their, what their flywheel was. So, so that kind of concludes out our our, uh, our stage two, right? So stage three is disciplined action, okay? And and I'll run through these. These are pretty pretty straightforward. Because I know we got 15 minutes on our timing here, um, but it's 20 mile march, right? And I've already spoken to this, right? It's this concept of rigorous detailed consistency and don't over or underperform, right? It's and not to say that you don't want to ever over you know overperform or exceed goals and so forth. The point is is don't overstress the engine, right? Define what you're capable of doing and do it consistently. Consistently, consistency absolutely outreaches heroic performances, right? Having that one big, huge month, that one big sale, right? It's about consistently marching every single day. You know, in in uh, on the website under this concept, he talks about, you know, analogy of like marching across the United States, right? And, you know, if, if you were to go and march across the United States and some days you went and did 50 miles, right? Then the days that you got to the mountainous areas and so forth, you could only do three, right? You would wear yourself out, right? It's about waking up every day and just doing that same consistent 20 miles every day. It's about lead and lag indicators. I'm a huge fan. Actually, I use a blended model uh, called Four Disciplines of Execution um, that it's all about just doing the lead indicators. The lead indicator is the 20 mile march. It's getting up and making the 50 phone calls each day. It's you know getting up and doing those consistent meetings with your teams. It's doing those consistent things over and over again instead of random acts of marketing or random acts of sales or random acts of management, right? Because most of everything external is out of your control. But when you have a tangible point of focus that keeps you and your team moving despite external chaos, right? So despite financial insanity or chat GPT blowing up or AE, AI or what have you, right? It's about 
staying consistent to your model. And for us, you know, a key framework for, for us has been, and, and we actually use a couple different frameworks, um, but EOS, a lot of you may be familiar with entrepreneurial operating system, uh, you know, burn harnish, you know, scaling up is also, we use some of those for the concepts from scaling up, uh, Stephen Covey, four disciplines of execution, regardless of what you use, have some kind of operating system that you run your business on. Right. And so EOS, I like, if you guys haven't been familiar, you read the book traction by Gino Wickman that started it. Um, and again, a lot of these, all of these are phenomenal frameworks that exist out there. Um, but it's about a consistent framework. And so EOS had a system that helped us define our clear mission, our vision, our core values, our two-year picture, our three-year picture, our quarterly meeting cadence, our annual meeting cadence, um, our scorecard system. So what you're seeing here, actually, so that scorecard on the left, right? We have a rigorous specific scorecard that we have every single quarter. Everybody knows specific key rocks, key objectives that they own. And everybody has to break those key rocks up into five chronological steps. So Dan's my marketing director. And you know his goal is to go land 15 more clients in the home healthcare space at the beginning of the quarter, right? Well, he not only has to define that as one of his key rocks that he's going to make happen, but then he has to break it down into five chronological steps at that moment, how he's going to make it happen. And what it does is, is it makes people think through the steps so that they can execute. And then every single week, you rate where you are on step one through five of making that goal happen, right? So as an owner, it allows me to quickly see across the organization, you know, some people may stall at steps one, two, and three for a period of time, but are we making progress? So what you're seeing here is pictures, you know, up the top right. Actually, this is my last trip in the Philippines a couple of weeks ago. That's with our senior management team, and we're doing our uh, 2024 strategic planning. Um, down in the bottom right here, you'll actually see a key part of EOS is doing a state of the company meeting every single quarter. Me and the senior management team, and you can see here all the cameras, we shoot it live and film it to all 500 plus employees. We tell transparently where we are in the business, what's happening, what's going on, uh, who's been successful, have we hit our targets, have we not, right? So I encourage you to use some kind of a framework and a system, and this is a part of our 20-mile march, is consistently using this framework every single, not departing from it here and there, but living and breathing it every single day. Next part of disciplined action is fire bullets than cannonballs. Uh, and so this is a simple concept, but the idea being is constant innovation in the business, right? Is constantly doing low cost, low risk, low distraction testing of concepts and innovation, firing bullets, right? And so, you know, Collins talks about this in the, in the book and he shares some examples from Apple and from others, but it's, at the end of the day, it's if you see if you think there's a new opportunity, right? Or if you're just starting or if you're looking to expand what you're doing, you know, fire bullets that, that are low cost, don't cost you a ton of money, that don't cause a huge amount of distraction to the business, but are innovation, right? Before you go and throw all the resources, the gunpowder before in firing that cannonball, right? Um, you know, so so for us, uh and one of the analogies um is uh, a lot of you may be familiar with Bill Gates has this concept called Think Week that he's notorious for, where he takes a week every single year and he takes a ton of things that he's been meaning to dive into and just goes and shuts off the world and his family for an entire week and sits up in this cabin up in up in uh, the Pacific Northwest and just thinks, right? And uh, an additional dimension of that I didn't know about until the recent book I heard talking about it is uh, this concept kind of like this the, 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 the CEO suggestion box. And we're starting in our company where it was an opportunity as well for Gates, not just to read books and so forth, but to survey all their employees and say, where do you think from your specific lens in the business, your specific role that we should be doing and innovating in the business that we're not doing, right? So it was an opportunity literally for all employees to put a suggestion in the suggestion box that they knew may get in front of the eyes of Bill Gates. Now, because of large they are, he did have a layer of people that would look at them and then distill it down, but it was a way to constantly listen. I'm telling you, your frontline employees a lot of times have got some of the best perspective right? That, that, that you would never imagine, right? With your company. So, you know, that list there is our account managers on the right. Those are some of our account managers that manage our existing accounts. And that's part of what we're listening is listening. What are they hearing from our clients on a frontline basis so that we can constantly innovate? You know, Brad, I mean, I've heard from frontline VAs, hey, my onboarding experience when I came on, if they would have changed these two steps, it would have been a lot clearer for me, right? And we would have never known that unless we were talking to our frontline employees. So constantly listening to the frontline for being able to fire those bullets for cannonballs. And another example for us, as I shared, is going in the franchising market, right? It seems to make a lot of sense, right, for us to provide VAs that can provide, you know, uh, support to doing the playbook for franchise organizations. But we're going to fire some bullets first, right? We're going to test it out. We're going to talk to some franchisors. We're going to evaluate it and so forth. going to test a few out. And it goes big. I'm going to buy a whole booth and be a massive sponsor at the biggest franchising conferences in the entire nation over the next 24 months, right? So bullets before cannonballs. And... Stage four, right? Once we is the next stage four is building, you know, to last, right? Um, and so 
that concept is productive paranoia, right? And this is very straightforward, but it's, you know, again, Colin's study that every single good CEO, even if you're riding high, things are going well, <laughs> it's always having a little bit of paranoia about what's around the corner, right? Obsessively ask what if questions to be prepared ahead of time, building reserves, preserving margin of safety, right? It allows you to handle disruptions and be in a position of strength and flexibility when those things happen, right? So don't get caught up in your own success, constantly have a little bit of paranoia. And, and an example on my end, right? So I have a, we have a whole chat channel, uh, we use a something called Lark that's similar to Slack. And then anytime anybody in our company sees an ad for one of our competitors in a Facebook ad, an online ad, or what have you, they take a screenshot of it, post it in this chat channel. And then I have a VA that does nothing but monitor that and goes and paste it into a Google Doc. So for the last three years, we have a running Google Doc with screenshots of every single one of our competitors' ads. Then she copies and pastes the ad copy, the link to their call to action, their landing page, and everything, right? So we can constantly be aware of what's going on with our competitors so that we're not caught off guard. And then another one of those examples is, is, is benchmarking our compensation, right? I'm fanatical at making sure our people are paid well in the Philippines. So quarterly, we benchmark compensation so we can constantly see what our competitors are paying so where they're going to stay ahead of the curve. Next in stage four, building to last is clock building versus time telling, right? And again, this is a simple, simple concept. You know, it kind of builds on a lot of things we've talked about, but the concept is, is that you know, a genius with a thousand helpers is time telling, right? Anybody can come and tell what the time is. It's who can build a clock to tell the time for you, right? So a lot of us as entrepreneurs in the beginning stages is you're the genius and knows how to do everything. And you have a thousand helpers around you versus those you can actually turn things over to, to run with, right? It's about shaping an organization with culture, systems, and processes to stand the test of time, to build a clock, not just be able to tell time. And so, the central part of this is just what we started with. It's about getting the right people in the right seats to help could build clocks who aren't time tellers, but can build clocks in your organization. The, the idea between behind time telling is uh, a more menial or less valuable task. Is that what that means? Right. The people can just, you know, anybody can show up and just look and, and tell the time of what it is at that current moment. It's building a clock that can, you know, can keep track of time for you. Right. Got it. That, and, uh, that's you know, similarly, by the way, the, the hallmark of a difference between a sub $1 million business and somebody who breaks through uh, is their ability to build a clock rather than to hire time tellers. Yeah, exactly. And so that's what, you know, with, with Mary, with our HR, you know, the, what she did with that, with that red carpet deal, right? It wasn't just time telling about like, yeah, hey, let's do this. It was she built the clock to make this happen. And now it's a repeatable thing that we're going to have this leadership summit every single year when I go back that we're going to do on a repeatable basis. Right. So she built a clock to make that happen. There, there's you know, another know. concept that I think is similar uh, to this called letting go of the vine, which is a Gino Wickman uh, concept, which is just the idea that in order for you to be able to have people building clocks for you, you have to let go of your instinct to make them into time tellers. And, yep. and that's what letting go of the vine is. There, there's this analogy that says that, you know, you're climbing up a, a mountain and at some point you have to let go of the vine and fall and just trust that you're going to get caught and you're not going to crash. And it is one of the most easier said, things said than done uh, of the whole easier said than done category, right? As entrepreneurs, but you got to do it. And it's this thing I call, and when I do my presentations, I have a whole slide called the 85% rule, right? Which is look, if it's brain surgery you're doing, you can't do 85%, right? But if somebody can get it done and get 85% of the way I would get it done, if I can have somebody write a blog and get 85%, I could agonize and all the words and what have you and get one blog out a month or get you know, 15 done 85% of the way in Brad's voice and be happy with it. That's generating leads and generating business and building a clock. Right. So it's about, you know, letting go and being okay with that 85%. And even with JCL, right. My very first VA, who's now my president CEO over the whole company, right. We've definitely had some stumbles, right. There's definitely been some things that haven't been exactly fallen right and so forth that she's been growing and learning and maturing into that role. But I've been okay with that. Right. Because it's, it's allowed her to journey and it's allowed someone else to run and, and run the operation. So I can focus on what I need to focus on. Um, you know, and similar to that concept, you know, fanatically committed to systems, you know, we did this whole thing called draw toast, which I'll share. There's a great, uh, YouTube video or TEDx talk on this. We had all 19 of our managers. You had two minutes to draw on a piece of paper, how to make toast for anybody that's never made toast before. And it was amazing to see the lens through which everybody else saw, saw the, the, the process of making toast, but it brought to light of like how we weren't communicating across departments, right? Because we saw, saw the world a little bit differently. Um, 
So to round out the uh, the last last one here is uh, uh, preserve the core and stimulate progress, right? And again, this ties back to to some of the bullets before cannonballs and so forth, which is it, it's about you know stay stay committed to your core values and your purpose that don't change, but but it needs to be coupled with an inherent need for relentless progress, change, improvement, innovation, renewal. Um, you know, it, it's he shares the analogy of like in Europe, it was all about finding the next wisest king that could run the whole you know country versus the U.S. You know, when, when America was built, it was about creating a system and a framework that could produce presidents on an ongoing basis, right? A framework that could be built to, to be perpetual and last time, not just relying on who's going to be the wisest king to run the land, right? So it's preserve your core and your core values and what you're about as a business, but create systems, bullets before cannonballs and what have you, you know, doing the, the Bill Gates Think Week suggestion bot concept. I mean, I'm literally going to send a, 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 an entire survey to our entire employee and say, hey, I'm the CEO, right? But I want to listen to every single one of you. Anything that you see in our business from servicing clients to your experience as an employee, I want you to give me a suggestion and I'm going to take some time over the holidays and I'm going to listen, right? Um, some of the best ideas come from those frontline employees. And back back to that two question exercise, Dan. That's why you send those two questions to your employees. What do you think, from your lens, we should be doing that we're not due to time, money, or knowledge constraints? And it is unreal what will come out of that 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 process. And the last thing I'll share that you know undergirds this is return on luck, which you know Jim Collins talks about that none of the companies that he studied got any better or worse luck. It was because if they were prepared with all of these systems and frameworks, when good or bad luck happened, they were there to be prepared to survive it if it was bad luck or to take advantage of it when it was good luck, right? Because we had the frameworks and systems in place and we create a model to be able to work from home virtually and what have you. When COVID hit, we thrived, right? When others got crushed. So we got a 10x return on bad luck because of how we were positioned, right? So it's it's the concept of luck. Oh, that company was lucky. That's why they were successful, right? That wasn't a determining factor in any of the studies that he had, right? And so work from home culture, tight systems and processes, using the EOS framework for vision and goal setting, right? That's what allowed us to survive through that mess, right? And so I know we're- Dude, tired just, to, a, 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 just a quick word. Yeah. We'll, we'll go, we can go about 15 minutes long. Uh, thank you guys for sticking around for us. I, I don't want you to feel yeah. so rushed that it makes yeah. it um, kind of difficult to follow. Uh, go, go back to return on luck. Yep. Thank you. You know, I thought a lot about this concept of return on luck because I'm exposed to thousands of businesses. And frankly, a lot of very, quote, successful businesses, large businesses are a mess. Um, and they could be $10 million a year companies where the owner isn't making any money. Um, and oftentimes they'll say to me, hey, we want to grow to $20 million. I'm like, you know, $20 million, you have twice as many problems, like hi hire a CFO to help you actually get some profit before you actually try to grow. Uh, and there's this concept of plateau then grow that every time you grow to a larger size, you need to stabilize and plateau a little to absorb it operationally, make sure that the company is uh, operating and then grow to that next stage. Um, unless you're, you know, a Silicon Valley um, venture backed, you know, skyrocketing hockey stick growth. The the growth model for most small businesses uh, is more uh, plateaus uh, that that are followed by rapid growth. And one of the biggest things that I've learned um, is they are lucky, but they were also ready. The great businesses have the highest return on luck, and that's really what um, uh, Brad is trying to point out here is is readiness is all you, you're going to get unlucky and you'll <laughs> survive during the bad periods of luck and you'll grow even faster during the, the good luck. And your goal is to just stick around. Um, I know Vern Harnish has said that um, 10 uh, every 10 years, you have a year of incredible growth. You have a year of terrible uh, returns. And then the other eight <laughs> years are somewhere in the middle. Um, by the way, we just put out the uh, Net Promoter Score survey. Uh, please uh, let us know how we did today. And if you're able to stick around, uh, I know that uh, Brad has a lot more to offer. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, 
jump here to the last uh, piece of it. And thanks for the additional color on that. And yeah, you're right. It's uh, it, these large companies and tell you working, we get a chance to see through the lens of a lot of big companies we work with and they are absolutely <laughs> quite a, quite a mess. Uh, in, in some cases you don't, you don't realize uh, what's kind of behind the scenes. So don't feel bad as a small business, large companies are still dealing with the same kind of tangled situation. Um, so if you go back to the map and you recall, right, we got the four different buckets, disciplined people, disciplined thought, disciplined action, right, to build lasting results. Those are all the inputs, right? If you do all those inputs correctly, the outputs should be, right, is how do we actually, the criteria, what's the test that if you do these inputs, what are the criteria to test if you truly can be an enduring, great uh, company, right? And, you know, the three things he that he talks about is superior results, distinctive impact, and lasting endurance, Right. And again, these are relatively straightforward, but superior results, these are the tests. Are you winning at the game, right? Like, first of all, are you delivering results? You know, are you living and breathing your mission statement? Do you have high employee retention, engaged culture? Do you have high customer retention and satisfaction, right? Because I kind of broke these up into leading and lagging indicators. Because if you're doing those right, then you should be achieving your targeted returns on invested capital, right? Whether it's your own capital, the credit cards you're maxing out to, to fund this company or uh, investors money that you're getting. Um, or effectively able to achieve, you know, what you predict, right? And I tell you, that's that's one of the biggest things you know that you are starting to be successful and you're getting results is when you can more accurately predict what you're capable of doing. And that's one of the things I love about the EOS framework and that whole five-step process. When people create goals, they've got to come up with five steps because I can't tell you how many times we've created a, a, a critical goal. And then once we start thinking through the steps, we're like, we get to step three and we're like, whoo. I think we're way over our skis here. I think we chose too big of a goal. Let's let's re-index here. Let's make sure that we are getting we're predicting what we're capable to do as an organization without burning ourselves out. Um, so, are you generating superior results? Secondly, you know, and for us, you know, case study is like you know one of the indicators for us is you know we've we've won six global or national awards in the last you know four years. Um, you know, and, and I encourage all of you to apply for any awards that there are in your industry. You know, they're, they're valuable for a couple different perspectives. One is you're just going through the exercise of applying for these and what they ask you, it actually makes you flesh out some things that you maybe had not otherwise, some things we had to complete on these applications. Um, and then secondly, it's, you know, authority and credibility, right? You know, companies are looking for reasons to choose you versus someone else or choose your competitor over you. And, you know, when we have these logos and we have these, they, they, they know that these are reliable, credible organizations, that they have a process you have to go through to apply to win these things. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the measuring sticks for us is these awards that we've won. And when I go to things like, you know, that that Oscar Knight's red carpet experience with our employees, and I see our employees in tears up in front of an entire room sharing what it's meant to them to grow in the outsource access organization, right? That's how I know that we're fulfilling on our commitment to our employees as well as our clients. You know, the second is, are you having a distinctive impact, right? And I love, I absolutely love this phrase, and this is a great litmus test to evaluate your company against. Does your company make such a contribution to the community with profound excellence that if it were to disappear, it would leave a gaping hole, right? And everybody can envision that, that gaping hole that could not be easily be filled by any other institution on the planet, right? If your organization went away, who would miss it and why, right? And I just think that's a profound thing to really try and aspire to in building a company and organization, right? You know, if BizHack went away tomorrow, there's a lot of people that rely on this content that has made a huge impact that maybe hopefully some people listening to the content today, it may change your trajectory and your life and your business. And I think Dan can go to bed at night knowing that it would be leaving a gaping hole, right? And the same thing for us at Outsource Access. And, and when I see, you know, during COVID, you know, we were the last person that some people kept in their organization. We had one company that provided, uh, you know, uh, uh, catering services to the technology industry and in, in out in California, 70 employees providing catering and food services. And they ended up having to fire everyone. And his only person he kept was his one VA with outsource access. And we worked closely with him and helped him figure out how to reboot and retool. And actually he had learned how to create a whole online course, teaching other chefs how to launch their own cooking business. Right. If it wasn't for us and having an affordable resource that he could hang on to despite all the crises and having to fire all the other employees, he never would have gotten on the other side of it. And now he has a thriving business in that space. You know, the shot well, so I shared earlier, you know, this, you know, couple, you know, may, some of you maybe relate, husband and wife team had this video production company. They shoot weddings and graduations and so forth, mainly webbings, is their mainly, right? You know, that we have a little video that they did and shared with us. 
you know, they took a vacation for the first time in four years because of getting their VA K on board, who was not able to not only just take on social media, took on their bookkeeping, took on logistics, took on client coordination, right? So for us, it's we'd be leaving a gaping hole in the Shotwell's life if we didn't exist, right? So constantly challenge yourself of whatever you are. And even if you're the most amazing pizza restaurant, you know, there's a place called Blue Moon Pizza down the street or a restaurant called Super Rica that's Tex-Mex down the street we love going to. It would leave a gaping hole in the lives of my family and I if Blue Moon or Super Rica disappeared tomorrow because it is such a staple of our lives, right? So size doesn't mean, you know, anything, right? No matter small, medium, large of your business, do you mean so much to your clients that you leave a gaping, gaping hole? Are you making a distinctive impact, right? And it starts with the right people in the right seats, right? Uh, it's, it's part of what's going to help make sure that you're making that distinctive impact. And then the last litmus test is lasting endurance, right? A truly great organization prospers over a long period of time beyond any great idea, market, tech, cycle, well-funded. When clobbered by setbacks, it finds a way to bounce back stronger than before. It transcends dependence on any single extraordinary leader, right? Even you, right? Not the genius with a thousand helpers. If your organization cannot be great without you, then it is not yet a truly orga great organization, right? So if your business is wrapped around you, your brand, you, and, and honestly, guys, for me, that was a part of the challenge to begin with, right? Everybody knew Brad Stevens was this outsourcing expert. They didn't even know the name of my company. It was just like, hey, that Brad Stevens guy, he, he knows about outsourcing. You know, go email him and reach out and so forth. You know, a lot of it was wrapped around me and my thought leadership, right? I had to get the outsource access brand and name and a perpetuating. I had to get a lot of clock builders around me, right? to deliver these amazing experiences. So now I used to know all of our clients. Frankly, I have no idea who half our clients are now, right? And I have no idea the stuff we're doing. I took a look at one of our playbooks. It was an 82 page playbook we're doing for a client we've been with for three years. And it's crazy the stuff that we're doing for these businesses, right? And it's a good thing that I don't know that stuff, right? So it's been able to kind of outgrow me. So for us, right, it's still a to be determined, right? Are we going to be be here 10, 15, 20 years from now? Have we been able to evolve? You know, how are we constantly, you know, preserving the core and stimulating progress? You know, it's still still to be determined, but it's looking good so far. And, and the big theme around that is disciplined people, disciplined thought, disciplined action, getting the right people in the right systems. And this is Jay Sell and I during my last trip over there, you know, at our state of the company meeting. Um, you know, that that young woman changed my life. I think I changed, you know, changed her life. Um, and the two of us together, EOS calls it, you know, I'm the visionary, she's the integrator. When you have the right combination, it's called rocket fuel. And uh, and that's kind of what we've been experiencing, in, you know, thus far. So if we stick to who we are, we stick to our core values, we stick to our commitment, we stick to our flywheel, we stick to our hedgehog concept, we continually face the brutal facts, you know, but we believe we're going to be successful in the end, right? I'm hopefully to be marked among those highly successful companies, just like Jim Collins highlighted in all of his books. So. That's my final song on it, and uh, sorry I ran over a little bit here, but uh, hopefully we're going to be able to attend the test of time and, and that litmus test that we're going to be able to uh, to validate that as we continue to march down the path ahead and stick to these principles. You know, what I love about this picture is, um, if you don't mind me asking, how tall is your partner? <laughs> she's about just over four four feet or so. She's uh, she's going to kill me when she hears this. I think because my daughter is seven, and she's a, she's a little bit taller, a little bit taller than her. <laughs> And she's got, and she has some big, some big heel tennis shoes on here, but, uh, uh, she jokes around. We, you know, she, she's maybe small, but she carries a, carries a very big stick in terms of what her capabilities are and, and, and you know, and her, her leadership. Well, here's what I want to share with her. Um, one of my favorite books in all of business is called small giants mm. and, uh, awesome. love this book, but she is a small giant and congratulations to you for having met her and giving her. Uh, the space to go from being your virtual assistant to your COO and to building a business with her. I think that's, it's just a beautiful story. Um, and, you know, I, I really appreciate you guys sticking around uh, with us till the end. Let us know on the NPS survey if you thought uh, Brad did a good job. I certainly think you did. Um, and uh, I'd like to take a, a few seconds and do a little bit of a wrap up. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, yeah, you can actually advance the slides for me. So uh, first of all, um, thank you guys for your feedback. I wanted to do a quick review of what I heard here. You know, 
Jim Collins writes these amazing books. Um, you'll see they're filled with stats and statistics and um, research study. He is, in the end, really a pointed-headed professor type. But he's coming up with these great principles, um, and they're spread out across all these different books. And uh, there's this incredible online resource that puts them all together into a really easy-to-use format. And then what Brad has done is he's then figured out how to apply that in the small business setting. And he's shown us during this session how it has been working out for him at Outsource Access. So um, this is an incredible gift. Thank you so much. Um, next slide. For me, what are the biggest ahas? I think the number one aha uh, for me is that it's sometimes easy to um, assume that the lessons from big businesses are not applicable to us because we're little, you know, we're working in the business, we're a technician, we don't have staff, we don't have money, we don't have expertise. And I think it's really easy to dismiss business wisdom as being for someone else. And uh, I think for me, Brad, what you've done is, is you've actually shown me how, how wrongheaded I was about that, that I, I kind of, I loved reading the books, but I read them when I was working at a billion dollar energy company and I haven't picked them up since. And what you're doing is you're really, I, I'm going to definitely revisit Jim Collins, but now from the perspective of a small business and from an entrepreneur. And uh, these are timeless principles that uh, we can all learn from. So that's my big aha. Any ahas that you've had from uh, presenting this for the umpteenth time? Well, for me, just uh, just how much I love the energy of of sharing and 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 communicating this content. I've I've I did a lot of speaking for many years and was doing a ton of it and and haven't done as much of a high volume. And just uh, just reminding me and and getting my juices back excited. We're about to relaunch and do a bunch of new series on our podcast and and some other webinars and things we're gonna be doing. So thanks for the opportunity to to get back into some of this and and sharing the content. Um, and uh, and the aha for me too is I mean you you brought you brought a lot of parallel concepts through other thought leaders right and, and i think the the message for a lot of people is is that when, when you're seeing these messages repeat themselves not once not twice not three not four not five times but you know whether it's gina wickman whether it's you know burn harnish um, whether it's jim collins we probably should listen right um you know every thought leader and guru does tend to have their own flavor or kind of different vocabulary a lot of times but but a lot of the core concepts are are, are the same and if you're hearing these over and over again right uh, back to Stockdale paradoxes. Look, let's face the brutal facts that some of this stuff is probably what we ought to be doing. Um, you know, maybe may difficult, maybe challenging, may not be what we want to be doing. Um, but yeah, you know, and again, it one other final aha is just it validated for me that I probably on my own would not have done a good job and may had the discipline to embrace a lot of this stuff. But being a part of EO entrepreneurs organization in the last 10 years with people like yourself. And, and whether it's EO or another mastermind or something, I just can't encourage all of you as entrepreneurs to surround yourself with some other entrepreneurs that you can meet with on a consistent basis. There's no way in the world I would be where I'm at 10 years later if I had not have been a part of EO um, or, or other similar organizations that exist out there. That every single month for four hours, shutting off phones, all technology, I sit with eight other business owners and think and work on my business versus uh, in my business. Um, and so it's just validating again for me that a lot of this all was born out of, uh, you know, th those initiatives and things that I learned throughout the year. So uh, I mean, parting message with all of you, even if it's, you know, within this group, right, even if you have some colleagues in your own city is just create the discipline and have a meeting session with with fellow entrepreneurs uh, to, to kind of navigate together, because it's I, I think of EO and mastermind groups almost as like you think of a hot air balloon. And as soon as a hot air balloon starts kind of deflating and it's dropping down, what do you do? You're able to pull that handle, throw a flame up and get you that extra you need to lift. And that's what EO has been for me and other organizations. It's that handle I can pull once a month. It's that conversation. It's that meeting like this I can pull and it keeps my, my balloon floating you know, through those times when I'm drifting down. I love it. We as CEOs are the chief energy officers of our companies. And I love that analogy. I've never, I'm going to borrow it for sure. <laughs> but that pulling down that handle, uh, being in fellowship with other entrepreneurs, that's that's a, an energy boost that helps you um, survive and thrive during the rough times and be more resilient. Next slide, please. So uh, we wanted to actually leave you with a couple parting thoughts. Um, I'm going to take these because I love them. Uh, first, it, it, they're both, of course, from Jim Collins. 
Um, next slide. Uh, great vision without great people is irrelevant. Great vision without great people is irrelevant. That idea of right people uh, on the bus, in the right seats, at the right time uh, is one of the most important things. In the end, every business is a people business, uh, both who you serve and who is uh, serving them. Next slide. And then finally, this is about the idea of discipline. Um, if you have great people and then you have a culture of discipline, uh, a culture of discipline is not a principle of business. It's a principle of greatness. And so uh, many of us are undisciplined, visionary, all over the place, ADHD, you know, ah, and, and we have to discipline ourselves and surround ourselves with people who help uh, mitigate that uh, manic energy we bring, uh, or there's really no possibility of us building something great. So thank you so much. Uh, we have three more master classes coming up uh, after this. Uh, we're going to be talking about that mental health, emotional piece uh, in the roller coaster of entrepreneurship with Colin Campbell. Looking very forward to that. We're then going to be talking about a concept that Vern Harnish talks about called the X Factor with Barrett Ursek. And then finally, four financial drivers uh, with Eric Cruz. We'll look forward to seeing you guys over the next three Wednesdays. And thank you again, Brad, for your time and for all that you do. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. And so I ran over a bit, but hopefully it was worth everybody's time. And uh, and I can attest, I know all three of these folks and I've heard, heard them speak and it'd be well worth everyone's time to show up for these. These are going to be some outstanding topics. All right. We'll see you guys at the next ones. Take care, everybody.